Well, welcome to our fourth uh, lesson and um, to the Gospel Foundation lessons, of which eight, we have a total of eight uh, lessons, so we are at half point right now. Yes? Are we going to um, have class next Sunday? No, we'll skip next Sunday and we'll resume Sunday after, because the retreat is happening, so lots yeah, of you, be yeah, be gone, so. And uh, next lesson Tim's gonna teach, so next four lessons he's gonna teach. So, good, today's lesson is about Christ, but let's go to your uh, assignments. Have you guys had fun with assignments, or it was like, oh, I had to do it last minute, you know? In this couple verses, I either felt maybe something was off. Like it, that it wasn't was, in there? Yeah. Yeah, I was like rereading, reading verses like, like, below and higher, and yeah, there was none. Like, the, like Jeremiah 69? Jeremiah 69. Yeah. yeah. That, there was nothing in there that said mm -hmm. invariably. Uh huh. Yeah. Or even close. I feel sad for that because it says that like he's gonna he's gonna take away joy from them. But so I don't know if that's correct. And then Romans one thirty one. I think you meant verse twenty five because I found the answer in verse twenty five in that one. One twenty one. Um, yeah. So Romans one thirty one. Foolish doctrine. No, 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 one thirty one. Oh, one thirty one. And I found the answer to that one in verse Exchange 25. Truth for a lie. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Is it in 25? Yeah. Okay. okay, you have, you had a question or you're coming? I was going to say that I need my best guess on three of them. And three of them? All right, let's read them. So, what do you got? Philip, let's start with you. Genesis 6, evil thoughts for only evil continually. Continuously, yes. I was here last time. I'll see. Okay, so you know, look at his. Look at his. Uh, Jeremiah sixteen nine. Incredibly sad heart. Wicked. Wicked heart. Hmm. Wicked. Is so. Uh, is it from? From the right translation. There? Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah thirteen twenty three. Accustomed to doing evil. Yes. Romans one twenty one, like we said, is you didn't get us. Is it man? Dark and heart. A foolish dark and heart. Thirty one, Natalie already said. So let's yeah. keep this one. Um, what was that one? The lie, <laughs> for a lie. Exchange truth for a lie. Romans three eleven. Do not seek God. Do not seek God. Romans eight five. So their minds on the flesh. On the flesh, that's right. Romans 8, 7. Christine? The hostile? The mindset of the flesh is hostile? Yes, flesh. yes. Yeah. Hostile. So I'll do Romans 8, 7. Also, do not submit to God. Romans 8, 8. Not please God. Not please God. First uh, Corinthians 2, 14. Spirit, spiritual truth as foolishness. That's right. They cannot understand. 20, uh, 214. So they cannot understand the Spirit of God. Yeah, the Word. 2 Corinthians 4.3. Veiled? Yes, veiled. Veil. So, you know what veil is? It's like Zanavieska. Like veil. 2 uh, Corinthians 4.4. 4. Um, control? Blinded by Satan. John 3 19. Love darkness. Yes, love darkness. So, there's a, <laughs> there's a mix, right? Love darkness. Like, how can you do that? But that's what it is. Roman, uh, John 3 20. Oh, do not come to the light. Yeah. John 4 5 40. I didn't do that one. Okay. Unwilling to come to Jesus. Ephesians 2 1. Dead and trespasses. Yes. Dead. 
Ephesians 2 2. Satan's working in them? Yes, Ephesians 4 17. Futile in their mind. That's right. What's futile means? Useless. Mm -hmm. Useless. <laughs> uh, Ephesians 4 18. Darkened in their understanding. Yeah, Ephesians 4 18. Again. Um, without the glory. Without the life of God. There's no life of God in them. One more, Ephesians 4.18, and one more. Um, I wasn't sure, but I put truth, ignorant of the truth. Yeah, ignorant of the truth, yeah. They do not know what the true God is, and there's no life of God in them. Ephesians 4, and it was in us, you like to say, in them. Ephesians 4.18. Hard hearted. Yeah. Knuckleheads, right? <laughs> in other words, <laughs> Ephesians 4.19. Callous greediness? I don't know. Conscience. They're, they're callous in their conscience. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.19. Practicing every impurity. Right. Well, that was kind of fun, right? So, there's a couple of my mistakes, a couple of your mistakes. So, we're even. <laughs> Good. Uh, anybody wants to give us memory verse? Ephesians Two, four, and five. But God be rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us even, even when we were dead in our transgression made us alive to, together with Christ. The grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5. Good. That's good. Awesome. Awesome. So, do you see the trajectory that we're going? So first we started with the Bible. I mean, where do you find God or anything of truth is in some sorts, right? Outside of ourselves. And we go to the Word of God. And the Word of God is all about one person, Christ. Because Christ is the one who is revealing God, the Father. Then, after that, we went to uh, God. So, since He reveals us uh, Himself in the Scriptures... We have knowledge of the true God, and we talk about His characteristics, His attributes, His uh, character, who is He in reality, not what we imagine. And then we also found out that we, when we look at God, we, we have to look at Jesus. We're through, we go through Christ to see, to understand everything about God or anything about God. And the third lesson, we talk about ours. Our need, our need for, because that's what we read, very bad picture here, right? If you combine all these together, so wicked, evil, foolish, dead, blind, and, and so on, sinful, full of impurity. That's our story. That's our picture. And the, so we said that man's greatest need is to be saved and be redeemed to the original design. And the original design was to represent God and to pray and uh, praise God and worship and love God. And so we can't accomplish that apart, apart from Christ. Again, so all those three lessons, they were centered, they were, we were looking at, at the spectrum of things, but they were centered at one person. And the idea is for us to, to learn, to see Christ as a center piece of your life of my life. It's not just theological knowledge. It's not just the knowledge of the Bible. It's to see how he fits, how he fits in your puzzle of your life, how he fits in the puzzle of the scripture, how he fits in the problem of humanity. And so today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about him, about Christ, about the one who's in center. So I call this, we call this lesson the champion of our salvation. He is the one who accomplishes salvation because it's all about Him. For Him was created all things. He created all things. He went and redeemed all things. And He will be center of all things in eternity. So, and we'll look in light of Christ. What does He do for us? What does He do for us? There's a verse, Colossians 2.10, that very, very cool verse. That's a 
a bonus if you memorize it. And in Him you have been made complete. If you put, uh, if you look carefully at this word complete, it would, it would say, for in Him you have been made perfect. Perfect. So that's what we're looking. So we're looking for a perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect uh, life. And apart from Christ, it's impossible. It's only in Him that possible that we become perfect. And, and, and in fact, it says that for the believers, that's already reality. Because He says, and in Him you have been. It's not you will be, but you have been. So we don't realize that. We're missing Christ. We're missing what He brings to our lives. And therefore, we're missing some things. And we're not satisfied. And we're depressed. And we're going after the flesh and after the sin. But when we go back and renew in our mind what we have in Christ, we see that He's completed us. There's nothing lacking, really. There's nothing that we really need if we have Christ. So... And God had this plan from the beginning. From the beginning, God has initiated the plan of salvation or plan of redemption, right? There's a difference in salvation and redemption. I just want to briefly say that. So saving is somebody, if you see, if you see some, um, you know, cat, let's say, floating in the water, you want to save it. You just brought it back, you know, you wipe it and you dry it and let it be. So that's saving. Redemption, talking about restoration. If you have fallen from some position, you need savings. You need somebody to pick you up. But then He restores us back to the position what we're supposed to be. Like if a prodigal son, he wastes all things and he's hungry and he went away from the Father and then there's his, he has nothing. So he needs savings. So somebody would feed him and you know, care for him and give him a job. But the restoration of redemption means that he was restored back into position of inheritance. The one who inherits father's estate. And he give him a, a ring, and he give him a robe, and he throw a party for him. So that is a restoration. And so God has this plan for humanity, knowing that we will fall in Adam, that he will let us fall, and then he will save us, and then he will restore us. And he does it with all creation. With the world, he does the same thing. He's not just the scrapping things. And he said, okay, like a drawing that you did, and you didn't like it. What do you do? You just like put it and put it in the basket, right? You never go back. He goes back to the basket and restores it to the original design. And we talked about last time that man's fallen and he, from the glory of God, from the original design to be representative of God and to rule with God. So imagine how short have we fallen of the glory of God. And so God said, but I will save and restore you through you. Not just like from the alien of this world, they're going to save you or I create some other world. No, I'm going to save you through you. So I will send my son and he becomes you like humanity. And so that's why in the center of God's redemptive plan is Eve descendant. Eve has to bear a child, and that child has to be a Messiah, or the one who saves people. To restore the order in the universe, where God is honored, loved, and worshipped, and properly represented. Okay, so that's an introduction to this lesson. So, therefore, we go to the necessity of the Messiah. So, we already established that we need somebody to save us, right? We need somebody to restore us. But let's look at this word. You heard this Messiah, right? Do you know what that means, Messiah? Anybody? What Messiah means? Savior. Huh? Savior. Savior. What else? <coughs> Messiah. Chosen one. Chosen one. Yeah, that's a good one. He's the one to chosen to save. That's right. But uh, technically speaking, Messiah comes from Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach, or in Hebrew meaning anointed one, the one that put oil, so chosen one for the special role. Usually a role is of the priest, prophet, or a king. Usually 
if somebody, remember like uh, Samuel, he anointed David to be the king. So he was the chosen one. David was a Messiah or Mashiach, right? And an English word, it comes from the Greek word, uh, Messias, or like we see it in John 1, 41, Christos, right? In Greek, Christos. And that's what Christ means. Christos means Mashiach in, he in Greek and uh, Hebrew and in English, Messiah. So it's two equivalent words. Messiah means Christ. Christ means anointed one. So he is chosen one for a special purpose to reign and to save, right? Remember, like Andrew found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And then it says, which translated means Christ. So that's what Messiah is. All right, and, and you could hear it like Tsar, right? Or Caesar. It's the same word from Latin, right? It's the same word that means Mashiach, mean uh, the anointed one, the Christ. So basically, whenever we call Tsar or King or Caesar, we say he's, a, he's Christ. That's what we're saying. Literally, that's what we're saying. Christ. But we have only one Christ, and there's a need for this Christ because we need to be we need to be saved and restored. So what is the necessity for the Messiah? Two things must be noted here. First, the moral reason that we discussed before that men have fallen morally. We have sinned against God and to stand back before God again, even for a second, you have to be perfect. You have to be perfected. You have to be removed from your sins and from your guilt. And so the Messiah or Christ was sent for that purpose to clear us up and to deliver us up from our sins and guilt so we could be able to stand before the Holy God and not be zapped out like and we'd be burned. Because every sin that God cannot look at the sin and do nothing. So today, because the world exists because it's sheltered by Christ. In a sense, Christ like protective umbrella from God's anger. And God is not sending us and anybody to hell because Christ received all the wrath upon himself. So he's sheltering us. But in reality, when Christ would stop sheltering people, the wrath of God will come upon man again. And so the necessity, one, is that somebody, this Christ, has to, must be able to clear us up and to change us into some perfect state. And so for that, he goes and sacrifices his life. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. So in Hebrews 9, 26, the second part. Now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah. At the very point in time, at the very, very consummation, when it's like the, uh, consummation meaning like when you like you drink and you consumed it all, right? There's nothing. You, consummation. So it's like pinnacle of all things. At the pinnacle of all things, when God's anger could not be could not be sustained anymore, and the cup of God's wrath was full, like it was just like consumed it consumed the whole cup consumed he was able he was about to burst out on the world in the consummation of the time like we see he christ been manifested to put away sin so he said like let me take the sin and that's wrath so christ became this appointed sacrifice for us the second purpose is for this Messiah is like we discussed last time by perfect obedience the Messiah will restore humanity to its original place and rulership with God so he became a perfect man perfect humanity that was able to earn it's like okay I, 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 I could rule with you like whatever you decided in the beginning I'm restoring and I'm actually the first born I'm, I'm I'm the first one who's able to do that. Adam failed and I, I did it. So 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf 
so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yeah, so look at this verse. It says, it's, it's a very loaded verse, right? He made, God made him, Christ, who knew no sin. So he was qualified for the job to take away our sins. But look what he did as well. What, did, what else did he do? So he, he becomes sin on our behalf. So that what? What happened to us? One become righteous of God. Again. Yeah, righteous of God. Righteous meaning not just not sinning. Righteous meaning that you're doing the right thing, right? That's righteousness when you do. And, and when you as a boy doing the right thing as a boy should do or mom as a mom should do, it's righteousness, right? When we do something that we're not supposed to do or we're not doing it, we're not righteous. So like we, we said last time, if the coffee making machine doesn't produce coffee, right? It's not righteous. It's not good. It's, it's impure. But when it does what it's supposed to do, well, let's say you cleaned it. And it's all good, and it's, but it doesn't produce coffee. Right? It doesn't do what needs to be done. So Christ did what humanity is supposed to do, and now he made us righteous in him. Right? 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Let's read that. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we die with him, we, also will, we will also live with him. If we do, we also reign with him. Yeah. So in this verse, what did he prom does he promise for us? Live with him. L life with God. It's, so, it's big, right? You just live with God, but not live in somewhere in the corner, right? In a closet. Reign. Reign with God. Let it sink in a little bit. Like reign with He is righteous one, makes us able to reign with Him. So in this lesson, we're going to look at this Messiah. So we talk about the need for the Messiah. We explain what Messiah, who Messiah is, is the anointed one. And we saw the need, at least two needs for us, that we be cleansed and now we be restored back to our position. But we're going to look at Christ in his three, perhaps most important roles, what we could not do for ourselves and he did it. Right, and we, we're gonna spend another lesson on Christ and specifically salvation part. But right now we look at his roles and who he is, and why do we need these roles to be fulfilled? So, and these roles are they're accompanied by creation, salvation, and eternal life with God. And we'll look at the Lord, that He is the Lord. Christ, that he's also the Messiah or the Son and God man, uh, uh, God of, uh, Son of God and Son of man. And then third, that he is a priest for us. And we'll get clear as we come to the end of the lesson. So Ephesians 1, 9 and, and 10, let me read this verse so, and you just follow. Okay, and then we're going to go back to rotation again. We see that this Christ is centered, uh, central in the whole plan, like we said in the beginning. And it says, he made known to us the mystery of his will. So God has a plan and he gives us understanding. He, he makes knows, he, he writes about his plan. According to his kind intention, which he purposed in him or in Christ with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time. Now, what is this administration? What does this government, you know, what do we need administration here? So the word administration really meaning building or, or building a building or building a kingdom. So he purposed God, Christ, to build a kingdom in the, in the suitable time when time will come. And at that time, everything will be summed up, it says, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heavens and things on the earth. The point of this verse is that Christ is at the center of, of God's plan of redemption and God's world, where he's going to be the main, uh, the main uh, person. So it assures us that Christ is the center of God's perfect plan of creation, perfect plan of salvation, and perfect plan for future eternity 
with, with God. And that's, it's all about Christ. We can't miss him here. So for this, he needs to do to accomplish some roles. For this, he has to create the world. For this, he has to save the world. And for this, he has to represent the world or be a mediator, right? So the first thing that we're going to look at, that Christ fulfilling as a Messiah, right? He is the one anointed one, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. When you hear word Lord, what do you, what comes to your mind? Master. Master. King. Huh? King. King. The Lord. What else? Noble. Yeah, someone very important. Right? One of the most. He's a savior. In so, yeah, Lord Jesus. So that's kind of how we get used to it, Lord Jesus. Uh huh. What does it make you feel when you hear Lord? Small. Small. Humble. Humble. You're not the Lord, right? He's somebody's Lord, lording over you, right? Is the Lord? Uh, it kind of we we have an understanding that if there is a Lord over us, we have to obey, right, and and follow His commandments and stuff like that. So, um, does it make you feel joyful in any way when you hear Lord Jesus? Hmm. Maybe, <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no. It's like the master uh, over our lives. But we, can't, we get to this point to the lordship and obedience only with the joy, right? Only when we understand that he is Lord in his nature, right? Uh, that's how we we would react if we would understand, well, you are not just a making yourself Lord, you are Lord, you are the creator. So it's interesting that this word Lord in, in the Old Testament, it uh, represents the, the covenantal name of God. So it's not just like master. It's a, it's a covenantal name. It's with, with this name, he signs the covenant or contract with people. And he said, I am God, basically. I am this Lord. Remember in John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh, right? That means that the second person of the Trinity became a humanity at this appointed time. But who was this word? And this word was Lord, Lord from the beginning, because the Lord is um, uh, not just a position, the Lord who He is. He is the Creator. You see, uh, in Exodus 3, 13 and 15, we'll read this passage and we'll meet this Lord. And we'll see that this Lord in Exodus 3 is actually pre-incarnate Jesus. He is the Lord who is the creator of the world. So, pick up the, the rotation where we left. Exodus 3? Yeah, Exodus 3, 13 and 15. And Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So when God represents himself, 
to people and introduces himself to people. He says, he said, what is your name? Or what should I tell them? Moses said, what should I tell them? Who are you? Because I can't see you, right? See burning bush, but I can't see you. Who are you? And he said, I am who I am. Literally, that means Yahweh. Literally, that's how we say Lord. So it's the same word for us. We just transliterate. So he, a Jew, they, they didn't like to pronounce the, the name of God just like freely. So like, my name is Jan, right? Your name is uh, Zachar, right? And Philippe. So it was too trivial for them to call by his name who he is. I am who, who I am, Yahweh. And so they substituted this word for Lord. So whenever you see in the Bible, Lord with the capital letters, like L-O-R-D, that means a personal name of God, which Jews, when they write in, write in scripture, they didn't, they didn't like to even to write Yahweh or to say Yahweh, but they said instead, Lord, transliterate. But when you see Lord, and specifically here it says, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Means this is my name. And what it means, it means Yahweh, meaning I am who I am. Meaning I am not dependent on anybody. I have life in myself and I'm always present. Always present. So, guess who this was? Guess who met Moses? Jesus. Pre-incarnate Jesus, yeah, the Son of God, calls himself Yahweh. I am the Lord. Not just the Lord, the one who's just reigning here and ruling. I have who have self-existent in myself. I have full of life. And so this, how disciples was introduced to him, right? This is why Christ was killed because he called himself this Yahweh. In Genesis 2, 7, the same person who introduced himself to Moses, he creates the humankind, right? Create the world. Let's read this, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God created man from the dust of the ground and blew into his face the breath of life, and man became living soul. Yeah, the same Lord, and you see, Lord, L-O-R-D is capital, meaning you could substitute this Yahweh or personal name of God, God. So this Yahweh is God. He is the one who creates all things. He is the one who sent Moses to save uh, Israel. And he is the same person who was incarnated in Jesus' body, right? He became Christ. He became Jesus that we know of. Look, um, this is what earlier he said in John 14, 7, 9, when disciples said, well, Lord, show us the Father. They call him Lord with a capital L, but small, like Lord, you did a master, show us the Father. And he said, well, actually, I'm equal with the Father. And if you have seen the, me, you have seen the Father. So I'm exact representation of the Father. I am this Yahweh. I am this one, this God who created and who saves. So, and Jesus says, I am who I am several times in the scripture, right? You see John 14, 9. Everyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's quite a statement, right? Seen me, seen the Father. Seen my character, my nature, have seen who God is, right? John 10, 30. <clears throat> I and the Father are, are one. So we talk about that there's two distinct uh, people or persons, but they're equal. But perhaps the clearest statement of Jesus himself can be called Lord, Yahweh, the creator and all sovereign ruler is when he says in John 8, 58 about himself. I am, Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham, I was, I am. Abraham, Abraham was, I am. So he says, and this I am is really the same word, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, same word, meaning of Yahweh. 
So he tells them, like, before Abraham was, I Yahweh, I always was. And so guess what it, uh, it creates, uh, what feelings created in, in those who listened to him? They were like in rage. Who do you think you are? You think that you are our creator? You're not even 30 years old or 50 years old, they said, right? And Jesus repeats this, that he said, I am a shepherd, right? I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down life for his sheep. So again, he introduces himself. I am this eternal one, Yahweh. I am who I am. He said, I am the light. Hello. John 8, 12. The light, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk, should, shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's not only telling us what does he do and what, what benefits he brings to the world, but he says, I am. He introduced himself, I am God. So in addition, in addition to that, several times in Scripture and in the Gospel specifically, Jesus accepted worship like nobody accepted worship except God who create. He forgave sin. He commanded, uh, commanded disciples to pray in his name. And we know that he said, baptize them, go and baptize them, uh, disciples, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he equates that he is God. I am God of the Old Testament, and I am the God of New Covenant right now. So the Son of God, by nature, is this Lord. So when you think about this Lord who creates and who gives covenants, who signs with his name, and who loves, and he gives breath to our lives, the lordship or what we call him like master becomes like natural like of course of, of course if you created me and you saved me of course you're a master right but you're a master in your nature so in philippians 2 8 and 11 that is why when jesus went and became human that is why god calls him with this highest name watch this read this uh, yeah, Philip. For being found in appearance as a man, he humbled, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the glory of God the Father. All right. So we say he, we see here God give him a name, right? What name he gave him? Because he was human and obedient to the death, and he was perfect, and he sacrificed on the cross. Now, he gave him a name which is above every name. What do you think that name is? Yahweh. Yahweh. Lord, yeah. Yahweh Lord, meaning that he, he assigned to him, like, you proven that you are that who came from the beginning, who was, who had no beginning, who created all things. And because you, be, you was able to humble yourself, now you are Lord over all creation. Now you have proven this point. And now everybody will confess who you really are. Like, people realize, like, wow, this Messiah, this Christ, is actually Yahweh. He is the Lord of all. So that's a one thing. This is the first thing that he needs to accomplish. In order to be a Messiah, you have to accomplish those three things. Number one, you have to be the Lord. You have to be Yahweh. You cannot because salvation comes from the Lord and no one could accomplish that except Yahweh. So the Trinity has to send one of them and the Son is the one who come. He is Yahweh. He is God. The second thing that he, he needs to be qualified for the job of Messiah or Savior and, and Redeemer, that he has to be Christ. He has to be this, this Messiah who is both Son of God and Son of Man. Son of God and Son of Man. So to accomplish great salvation, the Messiah must be qualified for the job. And the qualifications are just to follow. He must be perfect, an infinite God, and at the same time, he must be descendant of Eve. How is this possible? 
well, with God, all things are possible. And he created this plan. And the only way how he saves people is through this particular Messiah. Let me give an illustration. For instance, um, let's say somebody wants us to, you know, somebody wants to live in space or to bring us in space. It's all oh, this is so great in space, but there's no air. There's no, there's no food. There's nothing. So let's say somebody wanted to be qualified for the job. He said, I'm going to go and make, ab uh, ma uh, make able people to live in space. And you think like, first thing, are you able to live in space yourself? Do you have an unlimited air supply? Can you live without air? So that's the qualification of for the job if he wants to bring us. So Christ wanted to bring us to live with the Father, with the perfect relationship. And so he must be the one who is with the Father, the one who lived with the Father, the one who could sustain the Father in his nature. And he needs to change us into the same aspect so we could be able to live with the Father. And so God sent His Son because He is the Son of God, right? He is the Son of God. Colossians 2.9, we see that point that he, he exactly is representative of God because He is God. We'll ask the track. Him, all the fullness of deity dwells in both bodily and Deity. Deity means God, right? So in Christ, all the fullness of God dwells in the bodily form. So even though he appears like a human, he was fully God. Now that's a mystery. How can God fit in body in Christ? How he is still um, God. But Jesus claims that he is God. Even that he had the eternal glory as the Son of God. And John 17, 5, he's asking Father of something. You know? And now I'm glorifying you, O Father, with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So before the world was, he had what? Glory. The glory. And the glory of God, right? He has everything. So when... He, he shines the glory of his character, was hidden right now in the body. You can't see it. You can't notice it that he is God. But he's saying, I'm claiming, like I have the glory. He said, now glorify me with the glory that I had before. Eternal glory. Um, when people saw the glimpses of this glory, like Thomas, look what he says. L look what Thomas says and what he does. In John 20, 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. So it's like the reaction is like when he realized, oh, you are past the, past the death and you are resurrected. You represent the eternal life. My Lord and my God and worshiped him. So he has the fullness of God, fullness of deity. Only the one who is infinitely holy God can bear the full punishment of sins also of, from God, right? He could bear the, the, the wrath of God. And so we see the salvation is from the Lord, Jonah 2.9. Salvation cannot come from anywhere else but from the Lord himself. So he must be God. Hebrews 2.18. For as he himself endured when he was tempted, he is able also to help those who are tempted. Yeah, he was able to endure temptation because he is perfect and he is God. No human is able, without aid of God, to withstand any temptation. But Jesus did it by himself. He also was without sin, right? That testified that he must be God. Hebrews 4.15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Yeah. Christ became a substitutional sacrifice for our sins in 1 John 4.10. 
In this, this love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Yeah, talking about sending His own Son to do that. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So when he, God offered to God the sacrifice, it was pleasant aroma. It was smell good. It was acceptable, right? It's a good fragrance from the sacrifice and the burning of the sacrifice. So God accepted the offer because it was pure, because the Son of God did this. So He is Messiah because He is the Son of God, and also He is the Son of Man. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 predicts that there was a Son of Man. Uh, there, there would be a Son of Man who would be able to come to the Ancient of Days. Uh, it says, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like Son of Man coming. One like Son of Man. So, human coming. So, in this whole cloud of glorious angels, I saw a human right before the throne of God. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, meaning that he came up to God the Father. And was presented before him. And they said, here's the one. Here's the one. And to him, meaning to this human, was given dominion, glory, and kingdom. That all the peoples, nations, and men, and every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So he, the son of God, but he became this human, son of men who was presented before God, and he could withstand and even given glory to him. So when we read Jesus, what he reacts uh, to this passage in Matthew 13, 41, we see that Jesus applies it to himself, Ellie. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness. So he said, I, I'm the one. I'm, remember? Daniel is talking in prophecy about that human. I'm the one. I'm the one. Because I am the son of Adam. And I'm the son of Eve. So he applies this prophecy to himself. So he is the Messiah who is fully God and fully man. Right? He also had human body like us. Soul, mind, emotions. Right? In Hebrews 5.8 it says... Although he was a son, he learned obedience in the things which he suffered. Yeah, although he was a son, son of God, he learned as a human. So he learned how to speak. He learned how to putty. Right? He learned how to do these things in, in obedience and in perfection. Matthew 26, 38. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Yeah, so as a human, he had emotions and depression, right? In a sense, where he was depressed, suppressed. So, he became for us the son of Adam, who could lead us to God the Father, right? But look at this F. Uh, it says, these texts testify that Jesus did not temporarily become human. That was like a shock for me. In the seminary, like I kind of knew that, but the shocker for me was when I took the class on, on Christ, Christology, that Christ took the body not for a little bit, but forever. Like he limited himself as a human, like we're pretty limited. I wanted to get out of this body, I wanted to fly, I wanted to do certain things, but he limited himself forever. Like he will be reigning with us in his body. He just didn't take this body like a glove that, you know, just I don't need this anymore. Like rubber gloves we use, you know, cooking or, or fixing cars. And they're just like, it, that's it. No, he stays with that forever. And so he united his God nature and human nature. He fused it forever so that he could be with us. 
Which leads us to the third point, Jesus is priest. Jesus is priest. So, He is God the Creator, Yahweh. He is the Messiah who has two natures in order to save us, but also so that He could always be a mediator or a bridge before us and God, always. We live in two different stratosphere with God. He is complete spirit and we are still in the body, physical world. In order to fuse those or to make bridge, there needs to be someone who could represent both worlds forever. Not only for salvation, but also for eternal life, right? So 1 Timothy 2.5 says to this point. But there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So in this verse, you see that he is the God, he is also man, and he is also the mediator. He is the one who unites us or make bridge before us or make connection or possible fellowship between us and God. A priest's job is to communicate God to us. A priest's job is to communicate God and his word and his will and his promises and his love toward people, right? That's what the priest's job. And also to bring us to God and said, well, even though they're finite or they're limited, even though they're not in, you know, not so much like cool guys, they're really nothing special. They are very needy. Uh, how about you accept them? And so the priest is the one who intercedes, we say, or prays for people on people's behalf to the Father and pleads for them, right? Well, you know, like in family, you have the mediator, some, usually it's a, it's a little kid, right? If the older kids want to do something, but they're kind of ashamed to ask mom and dad, like, can we watch TV and stuff? And they send the little ones, just go, go, go. You know, ask us maybe, maybe, you know, they will let, they, yeah, they're always going to let you and we, we benefit, benefit on, uh, you know, piggyback on you. So we know that Christ is the favorite one of the Father. Whatever he asks on our behalf, God gives, right? And we know that he, because he accepted Christ, he will accept us with, with him. Because, and we also know that he understands us because we are human and he is human. He experienced humanity. <laughs> well, he became our priest. He communicate and make fellowship possible forever, right? The great high priest is always ready to show us mercy, especially in time of trouble. Hebrews 4.16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Our confession that we need Him, that we trust Him, that we love Him, because He is the one who gives us things that we need from the Father. He takes it from the Father and communicates it to us. Uh, he made a perfect sacrifice of sin because he's a perfect priest, right? We read this in, in Hebrews 9.26. Otherwise, he, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yeah, he's the perfect priest who sacrificed himself and now the, the door is open. Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Yeah, no matter how much you want to represent humanity and plead to God, he needs to have an, you need to have an access to God. So I would say Jesus is the only human who could, who could open the door of heaven with his foot. You know, like... Because he has right. He, is, he comes home. So he passed as a human in God. He passed through the heavens right in the presence of the Father. Hebrews 9.24. <coughs> 
For God did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Yeah, the priests go into the temple, into the church, into the sanctuary, so hoping that God will accept him. But this Jesus, he goes right into the heavenly throne, heavenly uh, kingdom and heavenly uh, tabernacle right there. He goes right in a holy place. But here in Hebrews 7.25, it's to the point that he's always a priest. He's always a priest. He's always going to represent us before God. We always would need him. So you think you need him now well, while you have this body, sinful body. But when we will be resurrected and we'll have a new bodies, changed, glorious bodies, spiritual bodies, we might think, well, we don't need Jesus. No, we would need Jesus because he would still have access to the Father like no one else. So Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is also he is therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercessions for them. Okay, always see, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Always. He would always need to intercession, always need somebody to pray or to say a good word for you. Always. And that's a great hope, like we have that Messiah. We have that Messiah who is Yahweh. We have that Messiah who is fully God and fully man. And we have that Messiah who is willing to represent us. He's our lawyer, who could say. So the Messiah, the divine champion and deliverer, defeated death itself through his own death and resurrection and thereby satisfied our soul's deepest and most repressed desire. What would be your most suppressed desire? According to the scripture, our most suppressed, suppressed desire is to be with God. We want, but we were dead and darkened. It's suppressed, that desire. It's suppressed. We were being deceived. So God sent this champion of salvation who could bring us to God and keep us with God. So here's the assignment for you. Um, it's a, one, uh, the third one is a little bit new, right? In light of this lesson, write a paragraph describing why only Jesus qualifies to be your Messiah. Just write, like, this is why he is so unique and so different. This is why I need him. Does it make sense? Okay. Sounds good. Memorize the verse. Thank you. Good job. Appreciate it.